Good uh, morning, good afternoon, friends, depending, I suppose, on where you are. My name is Terry Wolfish Cole. We're here today to talk about personal storytelling. We're going to focus not so much today on the how, but on the which and on the why. I want to begin by telling you a little bit about me and how I came to do what I do, because that is in and of itself a bit of a story. I am someone who always had a bit of a creative streak. I went to college, I got degrees in creative writing and in screenwriting. And yet when I had to go to work, I put that creativity on a shelf. I had jobs, I raised my family. I always knew that I would come back to my creative self, but never quite how. My last job was managing a yoga studio and teaching yoga. And we're going to come back to that idea of yoga and how it relates to storytelling. But what I can tell you now is that one day I was getting ready to teach and a longtime student named Jennifer came in to class that morning and she said, Terry, I did this thing over the weekend I want to tell you about. She said, I went to a show where people get up on stage and they tell true stories from their own lives. And Jennifer, she said, Terry, you always start class with a story from your own life. I think you should check this out. So I did, and I signed up for a beginner's workshop. I signed up for an advanced workshop. The beginner's workshop was lecture only. And the advanced workshop offered each student a chance to tell a story. And when I got up and I told my story, I could feel something inside of me shift. I knew that I had tapped into something where I had some talent, but more than that, something really powerful, something that offered me the connection with others that I craved. Once again, though, I went back to work. I had to put this creativity on a shelf and figure out what to do about it. A month or so later, my family and I were going to New York. We were going to see a Broadway show on a Wednesday afternoon. And we went into New York on Tuesday evening. And that night happening in New York was something called the moth. Now, if you know the moth already, you're nodding at home and going, yeah, yeah. But if you don't, let me just tell you, the moth is the nation's premier true live storytelling organization. They offer competitive events called story slams. And that is what I wandered into. I got in with my husband off the wait list. I dropped my name in the hat saying, if they pull my name, I'm going to tell a story. The theme that night at the moth was fathers. And the story I had told in my workshop was the story of my tattoo, which is kind of hard, I think, for you to see on the Zoom, but it says, enjoy every sandwich. It's kind of a way of saying carpe diem, enjoy every day. But it's really at its heart, a story about the last time I saw my father and the last meal I saw him eat. I waited patiently while, or maybe not so patiently, while others were called to the stage. And in the fifth spot, the last spot before intermission, they pulled my name out of the hat. And I got up on stage and I told my story. The grades came in and I was in the lead going into intermission in this competitive event, my first time speaking in public, but that wasn't the important part. The important part was that at intermission, strangers were coming up to me with tears on their faces saying, I remember the last time I saw my father alive and I remember the last meal I saw my father eat. And again, I felt really clearly this human connection that is so important to me. When the evening was over, I did indeed win at the moth. I was gifted with a certificate suitable for putting on my bulletin board. I was invited to what's called a Grand Slam, which is like a tournament of champions. I showed up at that event two months later, ready to tell a story about my sister. My sister and her friends and my friends were all there. And again, my second time speaking in public, totally no idea what I was doing, I won at the moth. This time I was given a t-shirt and a tote bag and tickets to the moth for a year. And I spent that year honing my craft, learning how to choose and tell a better story. When it was done that year, I 
founded my own business. Tell me another. I printed business cards. Here's some free advice. If you want people to believe anything you tell them, print a business card because I talked my way with this business card into a local venue. I borrowed a sound system. I pressed my friends into service and I started my own business just because I believed in the power of these stories. I now coach, I produce a show, I tell others how to tell their stories and why this is important. So the question, right, is why? Why is this so valuable, this skill? What does it bring to us? How can it impact our success, our relationship success, our professional success? our personal success. So the, the question there to me is, when might you tell your story, right? I tell my stories on stage. I go to the moth, I produce a show, but there are a million opportunities to tell your story. You might be at family events, right? You might be a grandparent at Thanksgiving who wants to share a story and doesn't want the grandchildren to roll their eyes going, oh, here she goes again, because they know when you tell a story, it's going to be interesting. You might be in a social situation by which I kind of mean trying to get a second date, but it could be anything. You could be giving a speech. You could be at a professional gathering. You could be on a job interview, a college interview. Some people use storytelling as part of their fundraising work, as part of their yoga teaching. It might be, I don't know, you tell me. If you have other ideas, throw it into the Q&A or into the chat and let us know when do you think you might tell your story. But what I want to do right now is I want to tell the story that won at the moth. Because as we move forward to the second half of our time together, I want us to have something kind of common to be able to refer back to. So get comfy. This is the fun part. When I was a little kid growing up in Buffalo, New York, my father worked as a pharmacist. And in those days, the pharmacists were out of the house for long hours. He might be gone from eight in the morning till 1130 at night. And this left my mother, who was a very young mother, alone with two children a lot of the time. There was myself and my sister, Lisa. She's two years younger than I am. And my mother... I now believe kind of in a move for her own self-preservation, she came up with this routine that really worked for her. And every night it was both girls get dinner at six o'clock, both girls get in the bathtub at 6.30, both girls go to bed at seven o'clock, 12 months a year. I would go to sleep in the summer and hear the other children playing outside. And it went on like this until the summer I was five when I was playing next door one day with the Shrek girls, Marcy and Beth, and it came to my attention that in other people's houses, different children had different bedtimes. Older children went to bed later than younger children did. And I was like, wait, what? And I go marching home to my mother. And for the first time in my life, I advocate for policy change. I want a later bedtime. And I am denied. And you guys, this is it. I'm so done with this big sister thing. It is just not working out as advertised. Lisa, she's little, she's cute. She's got that eye patch thing going on. And I am somehow supposed to know how to keep us both out of trouble. And I've had it. So I go up to my bedroom and from the closet, I pull out my white vinyl Partridge family suitcase, the one that I'm supposed to use for sleepovers. And I put it on the bed and I start to pack. Now you should know at this point that although I'm five, I am fully literate. So into the suitcase goes Mrs. Piggle Wiggle and Nancy Drew and Amelia Bedelia and a couple of Barbies to keep them company. And by the time I'm done, there's no room left for clothing, but I know I'm gonna need a wardrobe so I get dressed. And I put on two pair of underpants and a pair of jeans two t-shirts, a zip up hoodie, a raincoat. And over the whole thing goes this crocheted poncho with fringes that my Aunt Hilda has made. And I zip my bag and I thunk my way down the suitcase to where my mother is in the kitchen. And she looks up at me and she does not seem nearly as disturbed by the sight she is beholding as I feel she should be. 
And I wait for a second and she looks up and she says, hmm, she says, are you running away? And I go like, wow, to myself, I say, how does she know that? She must be a witch. And I say, I'm not telling you. And she says, well, where are you going? Grandma Sylvia's house. And now like, I cannot believe she's reading my mind. And again, I say, I'm not going to tell you. Like, it doesn't occur to me. I'm only five. I only know how to get one place. It's not that hard to figure out. But I tell her, I'm not going to tell her. And she says, okay. She says, be careful out there. And now I'm committed and I got to go. So I take my suitcase and I thunk my way across the living room and out the front door, down the front porch steps, down the driveway. I turn on Redwood. That's our street. I turn on Clearfield. I turn on Red Oak. With every step, I am dragging this suitcase full of books. It's high summer. My suitcase is loaded with hardbacks and suitcases with wheels have not yet been invented. And I am so hot and I'm so angry and I am so focused on my mission that I don't notice about 10 yards back in her yellow Plymouth Fury crawling along at two miles an hour is my mother. She's watching me and she is waving concerned citizens on their way like, Finally, I get to Old Lyme, Grandma Sylvia Street. I turn again. I get to number 73, her building. Of course, she lives in an apartment. So now I have to drag the suitcase up the stairs. And as I'm about to knock on her door, it opens. And my grandma says to me, it's very nice to see me, she says. But I'm certainly not moving in and I'm certainly not living there forever. And in this moment, I realize that I've been betrayed. My mother has called ahead and told her I'm coming. And I don't know what I'm going to do with myself. And as I'm standing there trying to figure it out, my grandma, she says, come on in. You know, you're here. Let's have a snack and we'll get you out of some of those clothes, right? So I'm standing in the living room and I'm shedding my layers and my grandma's pouring juice in the kitchen. And once more, the front door opens and my mother comes sweeping in. She sits down in my grandpa's wingback chair and she pats her lap and she goes, come here. And I'm telling you, I do not want to go, man. I am at this point righteously pissed off, but I'm also five and she's my mom and I climb aboard. And my mother, she takes my hot, red, sweaty little face in her hands. And she says, Terry, she says, what is it? Why have you left me? Why would you run away? And it all comes spilling out. Lisa and big sister, and I don't like it in bedtime and it's not fair. And my mother, who has always known me better than I've known myself, she tucks a curl behind my ear. And she says, Terry, she says, I had no idea you felt like this. She says, Terry, you came first and your feelings matter. I will fix this. Tomorrow morning, I will call the orphanage and we will give your sister away. And now I really start to bawl because remember, I read like I have this reader's notion from novels about how terrible life is for orphans in the orphanage. And I beg my mother, please, mom, no, don't give my sister away. I didn't mean, no, not that. And my mom, she takes a deep breath and she agrees that we can all give it one more try. And we do. That night we go home and she feeds us scrambled eggs and SpaghettiOs for dinner at six o'clock, puts us both in the bathtub at 630 and both girls to bed at seven o'clock as the other children play outside on the street. And it will go on like that for many years to come. But what I can tell you is that in the time since this story happened, my sister and I, we are so close, Lisa and I, two halves of one whole, two peas in one pod. But like any sisters, sometimes we squabble. And if this happens and my mom's in the room, I will look up and I will say, mom, Lisa's being mean to me, make her stop. And my mother, she always answers the same way. She says, uh-uh, you had your chance. Thank you. So that's my story. I ran away from home when I was five. What about your stories, right? The first thing I want you to hear me say is your stories matter. Your stories are important 
your stories have value. When I tell people what I do for a living, people push back in two different ways, right? The first thing, it's like when I taught yoga, people would say, I can't do yoga. I'm not flexible. And I would say, you know, what do you think we offer? What happens when you do yoga, right? You get flexible. Similarly, when I tell people what I do for a living now, they say one of two things. They say either, I can't do that. I'm afraid of public speaking. All right. So let's tackle that one first. Jerry Seinfeld has this great joke. He says, they asked people about their greatest fears. I don't know who they is, but they asked people about their greatest fears. He said, dying came second, public speaking came first. People would literally rather be in the coffin than giving the eulogy. All right. What I can tell you about me is that by nature, like I was born in the front row with my hand in the air. This is a comfortable way to be, a comfortable place for me. But I understand that it's not that way for everybody. We can meet in the middle. I can talk a little less. And with preparation and practice, you can get better at this. It, can, it might not be as comfortable for you as it is for me, but neither do you have to suffer when you go to tell your stories. The other thing people say to me is nothing really interesting has ever happened to me. And I would push back on that a little. I'm going to tell you the story I just told you is about running away from home when I was five because I couldn't have this, a, a bigger bedtime, a better bedtime. I have told stories on stage about a practical joke that my husband played on my family, about a dare that my son accepted, about, um, about my daughter visiting my daughter at Disney World in August and it was so hot I thought I might actually die. Um, I have told stories about getting a bikini wax on stage and made it interesting. It's not so much about what story you tell as about how you tell it. You need to learn to look at your life like a storyteller. I am going to recommend to you this book, Story Worthy, written by my friend and mentor, Matthew Dix. Um, it will offer much, much more on this than I can give you in a, in a 30 minute talk. But when we learn to look at our lives as storytellers, right? So I, I go back to this. One of the first stories I told to a group of people when pandemic was going on, it was online. It was a, a show called the 99 second story slam. The day or week before the story slam, I went to the podiatrist's office, right? And I was standing, lockdown was kind of ending. So we were allowed to go back to the doctor's office. And I was standing in the lobby waiting for the elevator. And one woman went up by herself. And then the next woman said to me, I've had my vaccines. Have you? And I said, yes. And she said, come on, we'll ride together. And we rode together in this elevator. And when before this, this, she was this beautiful older black woman wearing a very fancy hat and she was dressed. I mean, I, I hadn't even, I had barely worn a bra in a year. And here's this beautiful woman in this fancy coat. And before the elevator closed, she looked at me and she said, I can see your beautiful heart. And she blessed me. And as that happened, I knew I would tell a story about it on stage or, or in this case at a Zoom because it was a moment in which something shifted for me after a year of not being able to spend time with strangers. And I am someone who really digs strangers. This was my first real encounter with someone other than my mother and my children and my husband in person instead of online. And it was an important moment. It was a story worthy, as Matt would say, moment. As you learn to notice these moments in your lives, the stories will happen. Where to start? Start with the easy stuff. Start with proposals, the night my children was, were born. How did I choose my child's name? Something that is always on me, my ring that I got when my grandmother died. Um, those are easy, easy things. Pet everybody has a pet story, right? What to avoid is the stuff that we're still talking about in therapy, 
Um, you know, we have a saying in the story world, we tell from our wounds, not from our, we tell from our scars, not from our wounds. You know, it's not appropriate to share those things with anybody other than your best friend, maybe. Um, any story, I, I do always, we're all adults, but I do always caution people because sometimes people like to go back to that story. It is always good to go back to that story you've been telling for 30 years, right? That if I were going out for dinner with you tonight and said, tell me your best story, you'd tell this one. But if it starts with the words, we were all so smashed and it's only fun for the people who were there. That's not a good story. Stay away from that. Um, going back to yoga, right? I want us to think about the yoga sutras, right? Sutra in yoga means thread. And when we weave these threads together, that's the tapestry of our lives. But when we tell stories, we are not looking to describe the tapestry. We're looking to pull a thread. I am in the business of pulling threads, of unraveling. Those are the stories we want to tell. We want to find that small moment where something shifted for you. And it doesn't have to be a huge shift. It doesn't have to be the moment I knew I was going to divorce my husband, right? It might be the moment that I knew everything was going to be okay. It might be the moment that I knew I could bake a cake without my mother next to me. You know, it doesn't have to be a great big thing, but those are your stories because they are the moment where you learn something about yourself. And those are the stories worth telling. I'm going to pause here and take some questions. Somebody's in the chat. Let's see what that is. That's a smiley face because Noelle liked the story. How about questions? Oh, let's see who that. Okay. How would someone find a place to get up on stage and tell a story? So you all, um, it depends where you are. Those of you who are um, in big cities, San Francisco, LA, you have the moth available to you. The moth has returned to in-person events in New York, in Boston. It's fantastic. I caution you that the bigger the city, the stiffer the competition. I did not know the first time I went to the moth what I was up against. I literally thought everybody in the room was just a, a, a yutz like me who was going to show up and tell a story and, you know, walked in off the street. In fact, the bigger the city, the stiffer the competition. You will run into people who do this as a hobby. You will run into people who are professionals like me. You will run into people who've never done it before. But I do recommend listening the first time. Um, when you go to a story slam like the moth, those events are drop your name in the hat, see what happens. There are also curated shows like my show, Tell Me Another in Hartford, where producers will request pitches. Um, again, go to a workshop, go to a show, send your pitch in a way that says, I've done this workshop with this person, I've been to your show twice. Give us something that says, I have some vague idea what I'm doing. And for the love of Pete, do not send any producer four single space typewritten pages. Summarize the whole thing. Tell us what happened and why it matters. But if you are fortunate enough um, to live where the moth is, great. Okay, what about telling the story of business pitch to prospective employees or investors? Go to a storytelling workshop. I have numerous one hour library workshops. You'll hear the same story I just told you, but you'll get the how to structure your story and how to tell your story. Whether you are doing it on stage, some people like to do it on paper, at an, a job interview or a business pitch, those skills are gonna remain the same. You're gonna learn about the five beats of effective storytelling and you are gonna weave them in, whether you've got 90 seconds or 10 minutes and um, 
you're going to make sure you find a workshop. That's my advice there. Okay. What do we got here? What are the best ways to practice telling your stories? All right. Here's my big secret. Ready? I, first of all, I like to answer a story. I like to tell a story into my phone. I like to record it because I can um, hear where it's clunky. 99 times out of 100 for me where it's clunky is too much blah, blah, blah in the beginning when I need to just start with, it's 1972, I'm five years old, I live in Buffalo. Um, and okay, I like to tell stories when I'm driving on the highway. It gives me a good opportunity to speak uninterrupted. My absolutely favorite place to practice stories is in the shower. It gives you a really good reason to stay in that warm, nice environment for an extra six minutes. And if you are practicing for a show or an interview or anything else, ask your friends, your loved ones to listen. Use a timer. Uh, use a timer. It is your best friend. Most shows have a time limit. What else? Going, going. All right, here is where to find me. We're gonna skip that for now, but if you wanna tell me in the chat something you heard that you think is valuable, that would be lovely. Here is where to find me. At my website, you will find many more stories. Um, Caveat, emptor, the stories I tell on stage are not necessarily the same as the stories I would tell in a public workshop. You might find something PG-13 there. Um, you will also find a list of upcoming in-person and online workshops. Let's see, what else do I have? What do I have to say about reframing my own story? I'm not quite sure what reframing means in this case. Are we talking about taking a story and structuring it in a, um, like in a, I wonder if I did that right when I pushed the button. What do I have to say about reframing my own story? I think you're asking about structuring a story for delivery, in which case I would say come to a workshop because that is more than I can cover in our 30 minutes together. Oh, the whole story of your life, seeing yourself not as a victim, for example. Um, I'm going to think about the answer to that question for a second. How do I think about the story of my own life and seeing myself not as a victim? So I'm going to start by saying that I've heard a lot of people tell these stories. Um, I've heard a lot of people tell a lot of different kinds of stories. And although I have cautioned you to think about avoiding the most painful things. What I mean there is avoiding the most painful things that you're still processing. On the other hand, I think that sometimes telling our stories and sharing them with others, it is that personal connection. That's like the air I breathe. And when I hear other people's stories and when I tell my stories, it is a way to say, this happened to me and I may have been victimized, but I am no longer, but I have grown from that. I have transformed from that. And I am not the person now I once was because this happened to me or in spite of this happening to me. And I think when we share the stories, it's just sort of part of the natural evolution because we begin to see ourselves through other people's eyes. Um, I recently told a story on stage about an experience that happened to me where, and it was just recently, but while it was all happening, I felt like my one goal in this experience was to look good and like I had failed to meet my goal. And when I told the, stories to, the story to others and I was able to see myself through their eyes and really really hear them say to me that the success was in the doing of it, not in the besting of others, it changed the way I saw myself. And I know that I have heard many stories in which, that people tell in which 
they were victimized, but that doesn't mean they're still a victim. I think there's, I think there's value in the sharing. I think there's that the thing we learn from the sharing is that we're not so different from an, an one another as we might like to think, right? I have never been a gay man. I have never been homeless. I have never been a lot of things. But through my work as a storyteller, I have a little more understanding of what it might like be like to be that way, that thing, that person. So, all right. Anybody else before we're done? Oh, what do we got? Let's see. I love the questions part. Carolyn says, thank you. And Noelle says, thank you. And you guys go to my website, come. Some of these workshops that are coming up, many of them are sponsored by public libraries. Um, they're most often in East Coast time. You do not have to be a local library patron to attend. They don't care. They're just happy to have people there. So take a look and come when you like. Um, thank you, Blaze, for coming. You're welcome. Um, I'm going to sign off. You guys, here's my email. My website has a contact space. If you want me, come and find me. I love to hear stories. I love to talk to people about stories. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks for being here. Bye, friends. <laughs>